Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. I am your host, Darren. This week, I brought on Paula Amorim, who is the director of MBA admissions at ESA Business School, which is based in Barcelona, Spain. ESA was recently ranked the number three program in the world by the Financial Times, and they are perennially a top-ranked MBA program. Sometimes you do these interviews, and it's just magical. And I felt like this was one of those conversations. It's one of my favorite podcast episodes uh, I've ever done, because I think after listening to this episode, you'll have a really clear idea about who ESA is looking for, what they stand for, what they're about. Paula is an ESA MBA herself, so she's been through the program, and she paints a really clear picture of what the program is like, what to expect, in what ways it's challenging, and in what ways it can be transformational. I think you'll walk away from this episode with a very clear picture about the ESA MBA and one that perhaps you wouldn't be able to get from their website and brochures. Also, Paula is incredibly direct and clear about how the admissions process works and what things you can do to improve your chances and to show fit at your target MBA program. So I think even those of you not considering the SA MBA will really benefit from this conversation. Before we jump into the episode, I just want to remind you guys that at Touch MBA, our mission is to help you make the best MBA investment. And we have a number of tools and services that are available at our website, touchmba.com, that can help you do this. Uh, the most popular one is a free school selection help service. So you come submit your profile, your GMAT score, your career interests, your target schools, etc., And we will give you the best uh, fit MBA programs, given your most important school criteria. We'll also assess your competitiveness at your target schools and give you uh, some good tips on how you can strengthen your profile before you apply to your MBA program. So go check that out at touchmba.com. And do also know that each of these podcast episodes comes with a full write-up. So in this case, with the ESA MBA program, um, we write down the highlights of the program, what makes it different from other MBA programs. Um, so this could be a convenient way for you guys to research schools uh, before you apply. And again, that's at touchmba.com slash podcast. And now let's jump straight into my conversation with Paula. Here we go. It's my pleasure to introduce our next guest. She is the MBA Admissions Director for MBA Programs at ESA Business School, and she's also an ESA MBA graduate, uh, class of 2016, Paula Amorim. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Darren. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, I'm really excited to interview you and learn more about the program. But first, could you let our listeners know, you know, what you do at ESA? Yes. Well, as you kindly introduced, I'm the head of admissions for the full-time MBA at ESA. I'm also a graduate from the school. So I graduated in 2016. So my history with ESA has actually been going on since 2014 when I joined Uh, the MBA in Barcelona. I come originally from Brazil. So before my MBA, I was doing consulting. And during the MBA, I was trying to figure out what I would do after my graduation. I decided to go for education. I fell in love uh, for the industry during my internship. And I wanted to do something with impact. So I decided to stay at the SA, uh, which was um, an experience that really transformed me as a person and as a professional. So I decided to join the admissions team um, straight from my graduation. So I've been doing that since 2016. Um, And I take care from candidates from the moment that they start considering uh, applying to ESA or just considering a business school in general until the moment that they... Uh, apply and we have to give the decisions, right? So um, my team actually takes care of the candidates and then they turn into applicants and then they turn into incoming students. So 
So that's basically my scope. Great. Perfect. Thank you for explaining that. And the first question I ask every school we bring on the show is, what makes the ESC MBA unique? And and by ESA, that's I E S E. Just want to make that very clear to our listeners. Yes. So what makes ESA unique? I think it's actually the combination of three big pillars that we have at the school. So first is the um, delivery method that we have, which is the case method. So this means that all the classes that uh, we give, or most of the classes, I would say 80%, because some, some classes can be a lecture or a guest speaker, but most of the classes are a case discussion, right? So this means that you have sort of a business problem in any specific topic, like marketing or finance or accounting or operations, and then you have a problem that you have to solve, right? Um, then you have to read the case, discuss it with your team, and then you go into the classroom to discuss with the larger group. And then what is this larger group made of? And I think that this is the second pillar that makes CSA really unique, which is a very diverse pool of people. So in, in our 350 uh, person class, we have more than 50 nationalities. Um, we are also very diverse in terms of backgrounds. Uh, this was actually one of the Financial Times ranking criteria that was uh, included this year and that uh, looks at sector diversity. And yes, it was one of the best ranked. And I think that this is very interesting, especially in a case method environment where people are bringing very different backpacks, right? Um, and they are using that backpack inside the classroom. It's not, you're not gonna take advantage or get to know people's diverse background only in a casual talk uh, while you're having a coffee in the cafeteria, but you will explore that diversity of pets during the classes uh, themselves, right? So I think that that's the, um, these combination of the case method in a very diverse and international setting makes ESA, is the ESA very unique because you don't actually get that, right? Maybe you're gonna have some international schools that will be, and uh, that will use the case method once in a while, but not in the consistent way that we do, which basically all our classes are uh, based on a case discussion. And the third, which I think it's actually the driving force that we have at ESA is our culture and our mission. So ESA is actually a mission-driven school. Uh, so we believe that Business can make the world a better place if you have good leaders making the right decisions, right? So this is why ESA was actually founded because we believed that we could form those leaders, leaders that would be responsible, leaders that would be ethical, leaders that would, would care that the impact of their decisions is actually something to care about, right? Um, so we thought that by... Um, instilling those uh, values of ethics, of honesty, of excellence, of spirit of service that we call, which is basically an ultimate level of collaboration. Um, we could have leaders that would make the world better. Um, so I think that these three pillars of case methods, diversity, and a culture of service and collaboration and ethics makes the essay really special. Absolutely. And I know that when I had one of your former colleagues on the show many years ago, he mentioned that ESA was one of the largest producers of case studies in the world. Is that still true? Yes, that's correct. Yes, yes. So I believe Amazing. the first one is Harvard. Uh, and then ESA, uh, we do use a lot of cases from Harvard as well, because we have a partnership uh, from them. But yes, it does produce a lot of cases because our professors, one of their hats is uh, to do consulting. So they're not only teaching. So we think it's important for them to keep in contact with the job market. So, so they are up to date what's happening in the real world, not only in academics. And then many times from those consulting projects, they see an opportunity to transform that into a, a case. 
So many of the cases that we study at ESA are actually written by ESA professors. And then many times that professor is actually teaching the, the class, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And one of my favorite page, pages on your website is the FAQ page. And maybe I'm just kind of a nerd that way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I saw that I loved your FAQ page as well as your scholarship page, by the way. But on the FAQ page, um, you know, you guys say, while the emphasis on each area varies according to professor and subject, it is fair to say that in most classes, a high percentage of the overall result will be based on the value of class participation. So I just like to talk a little bit about that because, you know, as you mentioned, the case study factors in so heavily at ESA and... You know, I'm just wondering, like, if you could give our listeners a feel of of what that's like, mm -hmm. in the of having gone through it yourself. Okay, okay. So, um, I think it's interesting to try to imagine how a, a case class is, right? So, um, trying to walk you through an image here. Picture a class in a U shape. Um, where you have 70 students from, like in the classroom, you probably will have 40 nationalities. And then everybody has prepared the case beforehand, right? So it's not a case that is given uh, at, the, at the spot, so you have to read it in five minutes. No, you are supposed to prepare that case. You are supposed to discuss that case with your eight or nine person team. And then you come to the seven person classroom um, and to discuss with this larger group. And then uh, the professor always starts, okay, class, what is, um, what is the case about, right? And then you're gonna have multiple hands um, raising. Some people that are uh, strategic on how they participate, uh, jump in to answer that first question, which is actually the easiest, right? Because you basically yeah. just have to describe what you <laughs> read in the case. And then the questions start uh, being a bit more complex, right? Okay, so what do you think about this decision that the person made? Or how um, that would impact uh, the um, supply chain or the delivery of the goods? So, so the, 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 the questions start uh, becoming a little bit more elaborate. And then you have to, you know, like raise your hand to participate throughout the class. Uh, some professors can cold call, right? Uh, so get you to improvise a little bit. Uh, but the idea is that the class is built by the students themselves, right? The professor has more of a maestro role where he's obviously asking the questions uh, in the right way, the right questions, and guiding also the, the, the class towards the direction that he wants to go so that we can have like a proper learning, right? There is a lesson to be learned from every class and not necessarily a right solution because we're talking about business and what is a right solution in business, right? It's like it depends a lot of the context, the people that are making their, the, the decisions, but um, there is um, some messages and lessons that the professor wants to convey in each class. Uh, and then he goes and takes notes in the, in the blackboard. We have six um, pieces of blackboard that they move around. So the professors are distributing the information and the, the, the comments of the students uh, in these blackboards. And, and then the, um, the class evolves and the interesting part of having very diverse people is that everyone thinks with their own heads, right? So I was there thinking with my Brazilian 27-year-old uh, consulting mindset, um, right? With the, with, the, um, with the background that I had uh, and with the perspective that I have. And then the, the, the super interesting part about being surrounded by people that have very different backgrounds is that you see that whatever they see is very different from you, right? And then that your perspective is just one among many and nobody's necessarily right or wrong, but you will have different lenses to approach a business problem. And I think that that learning is very deep, right? Because it really changes the way you behave and how you see business, how you do your work, you learn to be right, you learn to be wrong, 
you learn to be disagreed on, you learn to disagree and you agree. So um, there are many learnings. And you can obviously, or at least from my experience, uh, as you've um, asked, it's not an easy experience to be part of, to be honest, mm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. especially depending on your educational background, right? If you're, if you don't come from an educational setting where participating in class is common, it can be hard to raise your hand and, and share your opinion, right? I remember I would get very nervous and my heart would bump. I would, okay, now I go, now, now, now I go. And, and then, you know, like my comment was not relevant anymore. And I was like, oh my God, okay, that's it, next time. But then as you do that, like many, many times, so in the course of the MBA, we have more than 400 cases. After 400 times of doing this, you you get uh, you get the, the, the hang of it. So you definitely evolve and develop a lot during the, um, the two years of your MBA. Thank you for painting that picture. That is so wonderful. I think that's the first time we've actually done that on the show. So that's really helpful. I would like to ask you about the third pillar that you mentioned, mm -hmm. how the, it's ESA is a mission-driven school and the program really prioritizes ethics, the spirit of service and excellence and so forth. I'm wondering how that is, you know, concretely put into the program and, and perhaps in who you look for in the program. Nice. Okay. The case method is a big driver of that construction, right? Or because through the case method, instead of like just lecturing people, we're actually making people think of different aspects when solving a problem, right? And this means that whenever you're thinking, for example, or discussing an operations problem, and if you should move the factory from here from country A to country B, and instead of just making the calculation on what's the cost and what if there is any tax benefit or you know like what's the labor cost in each country, you should think of okay, so what's the impact that that's gonna have in the people that I fire in the country A that I'm moving the factory, right? Or any environmental uh, impact if I move to country B. So. I think that with the case methods, we are constantly practicing thinking of business problems from ethical perspective, right? Uh, and the impact that that decision will have, not only in numbers, but also in people, in the society, in the environment. And again, when you do that many, many times, this is building in your your mind so whenever you are out in the real world this is actually something that you're going to take into consideration right and uh, so i think that this practice and this constant reinforcement uh with the professors and um, it's how we are actually able to instill that uh, those lenses in our students and then it's true that we also need people that are a bit more inclined <laughs> to um, to use those lenses, right? So that's, um, the, I think that the big mission of my team in admissions is to try to identify people that would relate to our mission, that um, we feel that they care, that they are willing to dedicate their lives and their careers to generating impact, not only being successful, and we think that people should be successful. Actually, the more successful our alumni are, the better because then their impacts are just going to be bigger right and greater so we want our alumni to be very successful and then but how do how do we identify these people right uh, because it's true that it's very subjective and we don't remove or deny all the subjectivity involved uh, or just uh, implicit in this process but what we try to do is to get to know our candidates as most as we can Right, so I have a very international team as well. They are spread around the world and we are a very approachable team. We do a lot of events. Uh, we highly recommend that the candidates reach out to the admission officers of their regions uh, so that you know, like we have more data points of that candidate whenever we bring them to the, um, to the committee, right? So 
we know our candidates very well uh, to the point that we can say, okay, I think that this person would fit at the SA. And another interesting fact of our team is that most of the admissions members committees are alumni from the school. So we've done the MBA at the SA. Not like we've lived the experience, we know what it takes. So whenever we're looking at a someone, we can sort of easily try to place that person inside a ESA class and imagine if they would work, right? If they would fit. And there is a very precious question that we ask ourselves is, would I like to have this person in my MBA team, right? If the answer is no, or I'm not really sure, then there is like, high chances that the person is not going to be admitted, right? Just because there's probably something uh, in terms of values or profile, right? Or or the, what the person is looking for. The essay is a very, very academically demanding school. And the case method demands a lot of preparation, right? So if someone is looking for a chill experience, <laughs> like lay back, I want to take a break from my work and just enjoy two years in Barcelona. The essay is definitely not the school for this person to come because we work very, very hard and, and we take it, we take people's participation very seriously, right? So we do ask for attendance. We ask, um, uh, again, the, the participation in class is rated. So we believe that everyone is contributing for each other's uh, development and growth. So we need everyone to be in class. Um, so the, the level of commitment is also assessed during the admissions process because we are looking for people that want to come and that want to work hard and want to take real advantage of everything that an MBA at the SA can provide. Right. So again, the professional excellence is looked for in, in a candidate during the application process. Hmm. No, thank you so much for sharing that. And I love that question. Would I like to have this person in my on my MBA team? I think that's a really good hint and, and a great question uh, for our listeners to think about. Can I also ask, aside from the case study, you know, the case study that's in so that factors in so heavily to the ESA experience. Academically, are there other places where you think ESA stands out? We take um, the experiential learning very seriously as well. So um, the the MBA is not just classes happening inside walls, right? So we have a lot of simulators, which is interesting, but we also have a lot of classes that entail partnerships with external parties, right? So we have this very cool elective that is called the Barcelona Tech Transfer, where we're getting scientists that have technology that will impact people's lives, but they don't actually have the business acumen to bring that technology and that solution to, to the market, right? So they work together with our students to try to build a business model that would be feasible uh, for the technology to be brought to the world, right? So this is an example. We also have the international modules that we call the overseas modules, where the students can go for a couple of weeks to um, Sao Paulo, New York, Nairobi. We used to have Shanghai, but uh, with the pandemic, uh, that was not happening. And we included Dubai, and we are also offering Mexico, right? So the idea with these, um, with these modules is to give the students a taste of the corporate culture of these very different cities of the world, right? So, so these are interesting and, and, and relevant uh, cities in different regions and that they all do business in a very different way. So that's also a way for our students to experience something different than what they are in, uh, experiencing in in our campus in Barcelona. So, um, and then there's always the, other than the case methods, I think that the, the, the team dynamics is also very central at the ESA experience, right? Uh, so I think 
I'm not sure if that is necessarily considered academics, but um, I think that that's probably what prepares us the most for the real world outside of um, the, the MBA bubble, because that's where conflicts are going to happen and some clash, cultural clashes are going to happen, right? So we celebrate diversity a lot, but we also have to be realistic that diversity brings a lot of challenges, right? Because you're going to be dealing with people that are very different from you. And from that perspective, there's a lot to be adapted and adjust and, you know, like just building a lot on your empathy to understand that people communicate differently, they prioritize differently, and they behave differently, right? So the, the way they express their ideas and their emotions, uh, if they express them at all, it's very, can be very different from you and that can be very frustrating sometimes, right? Uh, so the whole team dynamic is definitely something that is reinforced a lot at YSA and I, and I think that is where we get most of our learnings. Absolutely. And and one question I have about the format is I know you offer the option for students to stay for 15 or 19 months. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering which types of students opt for the accelerated option. Yeah. So we usually have sponsored students, right? So uh, I see. Yep. yes. Uh, so people that want to get done with the classes, they don't necessarily need to do a summer internship uh, because they already have uh, their jobs uh, waiting for them after the MBA. We have uh, family business people as well. So some people have left the business uh, to come to the MBA and then the faster they go back to, the, um, to their companies uh, can be of help for the family. And to be honest, there are, there are people that just want to get the most in the shortest period of time, right? So um, some people just don't want to be away from the job market for um, as long as nine, 19 months. So that's also a good option for them to accelerate it a little bit. It's also true that whenever they are at DSA and they are experiencing the MBA, many of them change their minds. Right. So this is to yeah. say that you don't have to commit with the 15 or the 19 month option before the start of the program. You can choose, you should, you should be able to choose it around March. So we start classes in September and it's only in March that you're going to choose the two options. It's clear. And coming from Brazil and now that you're, you're working in Barcelona, I'm wondering why should MBA students want to get their MBA in, in, in Barcelona and in Spain, mm. <laughs> of all places. <laughs> yes, I think that there is a part of that, uh, uh, the, that answer that is quite obvious because I don't know if uh, you've been to Barcelona or if people have been to Barcelona. I hadn't uh, before coming to the MBA. I had never actually stepped foot in Europe. Uh, so that was a big leap of faith. And it's definitely something that I, I recommend people have the opportunity to visit the campuses of the um, schools that are, they are considering. I think that that's a, that's a good way to go. But I understand uh, that not everybody has the resources, right? I didn't. So I had to trust <laughs> that I was coming to a good place. And I was very lucky because uh, Barcelona is a great place to live. It's amazing in terms of quality of life. The weather is uh, great, uh, it rains very little, it's mostly sunny, even in the winter, now it's winter and the sun is shining. And um, so it's a very alive city. It's very international. So um, it's, it's amazing to walk on the streets and hear different languages. And I have this fun habit of listening to a language and trying to identify what it is. Because <laughs> you can uh, be exposed to languages that too. I'm not really sure where they're coming from. And so it is very international and uh, the city is prepared for foreigners. So even if you don't speak Spanish or Catalan, you really don't need it. But even if you don't speak Spanish, you can go around um, very easily. And it's sort of a small city, right? Uh, it's not that big as other major metropolis around the world. So public transfer, transportation works. 
So that's, um, I think that especially when we're living such a, such an intense experience as the MBA, where it is amazing, but it can be very tiring as well, right? It can be sure. very frustrating. You can apply to jobs that you don't, that, that you don't get, or you don't get the grades that you worked hard for. So it can be an overwhelming experience. So it's nice to leave campus and be in such a welcoming and vibrant city as Barcelona, right? We have the beach, uh, we have uh, great um, cultural activities going on in the city year round. And, and it's it's easy to go to get around. It's easy to travel to other places in Europe as well. So Barcelona is very well located. It is a travel like a, an airplane uh, hub. So it's very easy to, to get to other places. So that's on the, um, the, the quality of life side. There's also another side that is uh, also very interesting that uh, Barcelona is becoming a big tech hub. So there's a lot of uh, movement going on in the city recently. We, in, the, in December, 2022, we had the Startup Act being approved that just makes it easier for startups to be to be launched in Barcelona with tax benefits. There is a new visa in place uh, for digital nomads. So Barcelona is really becoming uh, a technology hub. And, that's, and that can be very interesting for not only if you want to set up your startup, but I think that the whole startup environment gives uh, the city a very fresh vibe, right? With uh, news and update uh, trends in the city so it just makes the city even more interesting and it's also like a big university and research center hub in europe so we have many universities many research centers so it is really in the forefront of innovation so i think that the combination of these two sides uh, can be very interesting for you to um, choose barcelona as your destination and i think there's a less point that at least for me was very important that it's quite cheap. <laughs> so hey, that's you important. Get all that. <laughs> students. You get all that for a very reasonable price, uh, especially if you compare with other countries in Europe. Spain is very affordable, right? So it is possible to have a very, very good life and not spend so much. If you want to spend a lot, you can. You know, there's a lot to be spent on. Uh, but if you want to have a more simple and humble life during the MBA. I was uh, I was on a tight budget during my MBA and uh, like Barcelona really made it possible, right? And I wasn't locked in my apartment, not doing anything, right? I was really enjoying uh, the whole MBA experience, you know, but sharing the apartment with more people and then uh, buying my own food. So like it's possible for you to organize your finance a bit better and not spend that much money uh, over the course of the MBA. Yeah, I have visited Barcelona once and it was just a glorious time of the year. I think it was around summertime and it was just so beautiful and vivid. It's the the photos I, I took during that time, maybe more than 10 plus years ago. They're wow, they they really bring me back. It's such a it's yeah. such a vibrant city. So much color is what I remember. It's yes, just it being very colorful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if we can transition to talking more about admissions and mm -hmm. those fit qualities you are looking for from MBA applicants, we discussed that desire to make a deep and positive impact on the world. But I know on 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 your webpage, you're looking for like academic ability, personal drive, confidence, leadership, work experience, international outlook, good communication skills, team player mentality, and strong values. And so I'm just mm -hmm. giving you that buffet of uh, qualities to talk about, or maybe some of those are are more important, or there's something else that I missed. What are the fit qualities you're looking for? Now, I think that your list was very comprehensive. Um, yeah. and, and I think that, again, as I said before, it, it can be very subjective, right? So um, it's, it's a very complex process to go through. But we are, looking, we are looking at people that you can feel the genuine drive 
and care for others, right? So people, they're not just acting on their behalf and on their benefits. So um, to be more practical and more concrete, people that have been involved in extracurricular activities, right? Or inside your company, if you go above and beyond your original scope to maybe contribute uh, with internal projects, right that will make the company better or if you participate in any affinity group right to support minorities or any other uh, group that you feel would um, benefit from your friendly hand and people that would show a positive attitude towards uh, others right so in um in a tough moment in your workplace, uh, what was the support that you gave to others? Or if you had to give them feedback, how did you do it? Or if there was someone underperforming in your team, did you just fire them? Or did you do something to try to help that person be the best version of, their, of themselves? So I'm just giving examples of how to make all this, that uh, subjectivity a bit more concrete and tangible. And there's the whole part of the, um, as you said, the team playing and communication skills. Communication skills is extremely important at ESA because the case method really demands active participation. And we're not just looking for extroverts. I think that that's important to mention. And even extroverts can have problems in the case method uh, and on participating in class. Uh, I consider myself an extrovert and I don't think I'm shy, but I wasn't, in the beginning, I wasn't thriving <laughs> in the classroom and I, I did need some warm up. But it is important that you're able to convey your messages in, in a clear way, in a way that people will understand. It doesn't have to be perfect because a lot will be developed in during the classroom, right? Uh, during the MBA. But, you know, like we need, you need to be able to express yourself, right? Uh, and express uh, complex ideas in a simple way. Uh, so that's definitely something that we are, that we're looking for. And then when, when we're looking at someone and we're interviewing them, we think, is this person, would this person be a good ambassador of ESA? Would I feel proud of having that person as a ESA alum, right? Um, and then that can be because the people really stand up for their values or they have a drive for developing others or they're nice people that you would um, feel very happy to spend uh, some time with, right? Uh, and in ethical, challenging moments, that person, you feel that that person took the, the good decision. So... This is, these are some of the, the, the qualities that we're looking at um, in, our, in our candidates uh, to see if they have that cultural fit. I love that. And I love all the ways you or all the um, suggestions you gave to make these values or these criteria more concrete. I think I'm sure our listeners will really appreciate that. Can I ask about your GMAT and GRE scores and and what you're looking for there as well. Yes. So um, we even decided to, to take out the average uh, GMAT mm. and GRE from I our- I noticed that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> our message, uh, to put the range, right? Because we felt that um, the, the average can be very limiting. Um, mm. Because one, if people have very high GMATs that are much above the average, they feel very entitled. <laughs> mm, sure. But it's, a, it, it's more for the person, uh, the people that have lower GMAT and um, somehow that average GMAT or GRE can discourage them to apply, right? And again, I think there is um, candidates have a um, self-filter habit, right? So they sometimes they take the decision the admission decision themselves and say, oh no, this is too low, so I'm not even going to apply. And I would say that leave that decision to us, right? So yes, the GMAT and the GRE are important. It is the only way that we can compare 
candidates across the globe, right? Because it's the only standardized aspect of the application. Uh, so it can be very important. It can be very important for scholarships, especially, right? Uh, but you don't need to have a 720 or a 750 or 165 and 165 in the GRE to be able to be admitted or even get a scholarship, right? Again, and this is why, this is another advantage of having a very personable admission process is that we really know our candidates in detail and we know their struggles, we know their strengths, and we are able to allocate those scholarships and make the decisions um, even overcoming even a little bit the not that great GMAT or GRE, right? Uh, but again, the average GMAT is in the 680 and 690, and in the GRE we are looking at uh, a good a good score would be 160 in verbal and 160 in quant. So and we do have that average. So it's not to say that we have a low average. It's just to convey the message that. We do take also a careful look at people with lower GMATs, but have uh, proved to be successful in their careers and to have potential uh, to achieve great things and that match our values um, in, in a good way. And also, we really, really take the application holistically, right? Uh, so I think there's some message of hope for people, obviously. If you're looking at a very, very low GMAT, like we hope below 500, that makes us very nervous, right? <laughs> because uh, again, yes, it is very academically demanding and there is a proven correlation between GMAT and academic performance during the MBA, right? Um, so if we are considering someone uh, with a very low GMAT, that person can be what we call an academic risk, right? So a risk of not following the classes. Yes, it is very, very demanding. And uh, we do have some people, not many, like they're very, very rare and exception, but we do have people that drop the MBA because it's too demanding, right? Uh, be between the first and the second year. So we don't want that to happen, right? We don't want people to come and regret that they, they didn't make the right choice and they get frustrated. So I think that the ultimate mission of, the, of uh, admissions is to find the perfect match, right? In the, in, in, the, in the sense that everyone that we admit are happy at ESA and that we are happy with everyone that we admit, right? We don't want people to be, to come, to pay, to commit, uh, to, to do such a big commitment and eventually regret, right? Or, or get themselves frustrated. So yeah, so we do consider, but uh, very, very low GMAT or GREs, we will ask to retake. No, I appreciate that. That's that's crystal clear. And you know, for you, Paolo, what really makes an applicant jump off the page and get you excited to meet them? I think this is a combination of these two big, big pillars, right? And then I've, I've um, mentioned it earlier, and that we want our alumni uh, to be as successful as they can, right? Um, because the more successful they are, the bigger their impact. So we are looking at people that have a proven career path excellence, right? So they've had good career progression. They, uh, uh, when you look at their CVs, you could see that they made a difference, right? Uh, that they were. Uh, promoted faster than usual or that their deliverables were above average, right? So, and this is this is not that hard to get. When you read an, a CV and then you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> I'm really impressed about all these achievements, right? So 12% increase in sales after doing this or a reduction in delivery time because of that. And so whenever you can see you know that the, the 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 level of impact or and, and and high quality of people's work that really stands out, and that if that combined with the authentic and the, the genuine drive for uh, caring for others, right? So extracurricular activities or participating in internal projects or volunteering, you know, so. And this I'm talking only about the CV and then in the essays, 
people can get very deep, right? And I think that whenever people have concrete examples of these two big pillars, right? So the career excellence and the drive for impact, and they have concrete examples, I think that that's when it really stands out, right? Because then we feel that we really found a diamond, right? Someone that, and I can think of several examples whenever I, I interview a candidate and I say, wow, this person can really be the type of leader that we are looking into building at ESA, right? People that uh, will live here and they will achieve whatever they want. And whatever they want is aligned with making, you know, like making a deep and positive impact and, and, and helping others, supporting others and making other people's uh, lives better. So um, I think that this is really what stands out when we're looking at an application. That's so good. <laughs> Can I ask like, yeah, what maybe three things or a few things applicants can do. You've seen thousands of app, uh, applications. What few things can applicants do to make your job easier and your team's job easier and also to just improve their chances of mm -hmm. admissions to ESA? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think that I, I, I like to, um, I'd like to start this answer uh, by making people think what we are actually doing in the in the admissions team, right? So um, we are trying to find the best fit. As I said, we want everybody to be happy, right? We want this to be a happy marriage where students are happy and we are happy. So um, for this to happen, we need as much information as we can. And and we need the right information, right? It's not just about listing and 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 dumping at us all details uh, that might not be relevant, but we want like quality information that will make us be able to make the decision, make the right decision, right? right? Really assess if, if that person is, is good for ESA. So um, I think that the, the, the homework that they should be, that candidates should be doing is they should be asking their, that question themselves, right? So before choosing the schools, I think that they should do the homework and say, okay, is this really the the right school for me? Let me see if I fit. If I if I like the people uh, that go to ESA, right? If I if I meet those people, do I do, do I feel would I feel that I belong? Right? Would I feel comfortable with these people? Uh, right? Because I, I think that sometimes candidates forget that they also have power. Um, yeah, that um, it's not only the school that is choosing the candidates. The candidates are also choosing the school. So you know, like, and and come on, we have 350 students every year. Each candidate and student only has one business school probably in their lives, right? So it's a much much more important decision for candidates than for for the school right and not to say that uh, if you don't come we're just going to have someone else because everybody's the same no 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 especially when we give an admission decision is because we really feel that the person would be great at ESA but I think that the candidates should take it more seriously when they're choosing their school and rankings can be a great way to start right but it should be a start it shouldn't be okay. Let me just see what the top are, the top schools are, and let me go for the top. No, okay. You have the top. If you're going for a good school, okay, choose your school according to your motivations, your profile, where you want to be after the MBA. So learning, knowing your motivations right is very very important, right? And then co conveying those motivations and your story in the most effective way is also very important, right? So knowing to tell your stories, why you did uh, each move that you did, what was driving each of your, your decision and how your profile fits with ESA. So if you are able to really, really answer that question and have concrete examples to prove that, you've done our job, <laughs> right? It's, right? Then it's just yes. about us 
being exposed to that information and saying, okay, that person is actually a good fit, right? Because um, we have the, um, the, all the proof uh, that that person would, would be a good fit. And so talking to alumni, talking to current students, if you can come to campus, I know it's not cheap, but it's a big investment, you know, and I don't think I was the best applicant. So there is a lot that I didn't do, but that I wish that I had done, right? Uh, and and coming to campus would def- was definitely one of them. Uh, I, but I still remember the first time I stepped into campus, I felt amazing, right? Um, and maybe if I had visited other schools, I wouldn't feel the same. And then that decision would be even more clear, right? Okay, this is where I want to, the essay is where I want to be because I feel so good here. I just feel so comfortable and I just feel that I belong. And we get that from a lot of people that come to campus, right? Um, And I do feel that there is some sort of magic vibe whenever you visit the campus. And I'm not saying that it's just the essay. Probably other people from other schools feel the same in their campuses. But I think that this is, at the end, it, it's sort of um, a, an emotional decision, right? Uh, it's not only yes. about criteria mm-hmm. in an Excel that you, you know, like you give each criteria a rating and then, you know, like you have the sum of them all and then, okay, so I'm going to yes it. No, it should be about how you feel, right? Um, the alumni from the school and, and your classmates, these are going to be the people that you're going to be sharing your alumni network for the rest of your life, right? So. You should be asking yourself if these are the people that you would like to share the rest of your careers with, right? Uh, Because they can be very powerful contacts and they can be very powerful friends uh, at the end, right? I I say that we say a lot about network, network, network. uh, So it sounds very, very professional. But at the end of the day, these are going to be your best friends. And I say that the network is actually just a bunch of friends with very high professional potential <laughs> right so this, this is amazing because then you're just going to have very competent best friends for the rest of your life that you can count on for for not only your next vacations but also for your next career steps right and it's very important to be confident that you belong and that you like those people and so i think that that's a big big homework that um candidates should always have as their priority during the application process. And what is your view towards scholarships and and how can applicants improve their chances of winning some funding from ESA? So scholarships are, I would say that ESA has a pretty good pool of uh, resources to to give scholarships to. So um, I would highly encourage people to apply. And for you, we have different types of scholarship, but but the application process for a scholarship is the general one. So you just have to apply to a general scholarship with an essay. Actually, in the application process, you choose the scholarships that you feel that you align with, but the essay will be a general one. And then you have to answer the question, How do you plan to finance your MBA and why do you think you deserve a scholarship? So these two pieces of the question are, um, they are meant to give us a sense of both need and merit, right? So how do you plan to finance? So I want to see if you have 70,000 euros in your your bank account and you're just looking for a scholarship to be more comfortable or if, no, you have... 20,000 euros in savings and you're planning to finance almost uh, the, 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 all your MBA uh, with a loan, right? Um, and also, I think it's also the in the in the need part, in the essay, it's interesting that you share if you have any special financial uh, responsibilities, right? So we have people that have family or kids, or married, or people that support their parents, right? Uh, where the parents don't have any any income, or if you have anybody in your family that is undergoing med- medical treatment and you're contributing for that. So 
So obviously, anything that you feel comfortable in sharing, I think that this is important because remember that everything that you put in your in your application, you are agreeing to be questioned about, right? Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable talking about certain topics, don't mention them in the application because it's very likely or possible that um, the interviewer will ask questions about uh, whatever information is there. But I think that, that uh, those information, that, that type of information can, can be important for us to assess need. And then the merit part is, well, it's a very competitive process, right? To be admitted and then to get a scholarship, it's even more competitive. And so you really need to show us why I should be allocating that scholarship to you and maybe not someone else, right? So what makes you special? And what makes you special without sounding arrogant? I think that that's important as well. But, you know, like trying to pinpoint several um, of your profile that uh, you uh, stood out, right? Where you really contributed or a place, a moment where you really made an impact, any previous awards or scholarships that you got, you know, like uh, academics. So any part of your life that you feel that you excelled, I think it's a good moment for you to um, to point that out in, in the scholarship essay. Yeah, I think that, you know, like being, being concrete in the examples is also very important. So, so it's not that broad right because the the, the whole scholarship uh, allocation is a very complex one so the more the more information we can get the more com comfortable we're going to feel with the decisions that we make and one more question on the scholarships i'm wondering how you feel about applicants who yeah maybe they share what what makes them special and and stand out but almost use that scholarship essay to pitch like almost like an entrepreneur pitching their business, pitch mm -hmm. how they could add value to the ESA MBA student experience, right? For example, maybe that's leading a student club, uh, running a conference that you guys do, and they're uniquely qualified to do so, whatever that, that contribution is. I'm wondering how you view those types of essays, or is it really, are you really more focused on, okay, yeah, what, what have you done in the past that's been outstanding? Yeah, I think it's um, uh, mentioning the contribution, and especially if you can be specific in the, um, in the activities that already happened on campus, right? I think it shows that it shows knowledge about the essay, and this is definitely something that we appreciate and value a lot, right? Um, so people that we can see that have done their research on the essay are really well seen. Uh, so. Um, I think that if people can mention how they would contribute, that would be great. But I would lo also like to see some proof uh, yes. <laughs> yes. that that would happen, right? Because I exactly. can say, you know, exactly. I would like to be uh, the, like the president of the Responsible Business Club. And there is there is nothing in my profile that say that I uh, that says that I was ever involved in that right so it can be empty words <laughs> so that's my the experience uh, linked with yes with the, with the potential contribution i think it can add more value because then it just sounds more realistic right uh, and we're really trying to gauge how realistic whatever people are, are saying is right um, so yes uh, but showing uh, mentioning the potential contributions can be great, especially to demonstrate that uh, people have done their research, that they know what happens on the essay, at the essay. And if there's anything that they feel like they really know about the essay, but they 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 feel that it lacks, you know, like I would like to launch this, or I've seen that uh, this already happens, but I would like to have, you know, like, so maybe having new suggestions and new ideas. I think that it's it, that's even greater, right? even more exciting. Uh, Paula, I just want to thank you for being so open and and direct about how your admissions process works. I think so many people will find you know the last 20, 30 minutes um, invaluable. So thank you so much.
Can we transition to careers now? Obviously, the huge concern for anyone making a, a huge MBA investment. And my question is, yeah, what makes ESA the ESA MBA special from a careers perspective? Nice. Uh, so the Career Development Center at ESA is outstanding. We do have... We have the specialists on the industries, right? So if you if you need industry counseling, uh, you're gonna have someone that will be specialized in that specific industry. For example, consulting or finance or healthcare, uh, consumer goods, and etc. So um, and that's very important uh, during the the recruiting process because you do need to sound very knowledgeable in the processes that you are. And that you're applying for, even if you are, if you don't have experience in that, right? So um, I think that the the experts in in the fields um, can also counsel what's your likelihood uh, or best chances in each of the the jobs, and I think that that adds a lot of value. And we have a whole career management um, uh, pillar where we are supporting our students in some things that can be very basic. So your CV building, uh, mock interviews, you know, and also um, some some part that is more complex, right? Where finding your North Star, what do you think should be your next steps, right? Because we are trying to make people really go to the career paths that are going to make them happy. Right? We don't want to just drive them to consulting and, and investment banking where they're going to be very well paid, but maybe that's not their best fit. So we're really trying to make people reflect on where they would fit the best, where they would be happier, what, are, what do they want out of their careers, right? Uh, so the career management uh, team is very much folks focused in building that toolkit that will make students be more effective in the job search and that's also a toolkit that you take for the rest of your life right because the job that you're going to have after the MBA most likely is not going to be your only job for the rest of your life uh, you will eventually be in the position that you're going to be looking for another job eventually and then we want the, our students to have developed autonomy to to be able to be successful in the future job searches as well and so I think that this, um, there's, and then there's a lot of events, right? Uh, so this is just the, 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 the overall structure, but then you have career fairs in, in, on campus. You, we have what we call career treks, where the students are traveling to different countries to get to know companies. So um, the Career Center is also helping the professional clubs organize those treks. Uh, I personally went to the Berlin track that was a startup track. And so we visited like 15 startups. We visited TransferWise, Uber, uh, Rocket Internet. So it was very interesting to, to get to know like a very different environment. I went to the tech track in London. So we met with Amazon, with, met, uh, uh, with Samsung, with um IBM, so uh, we do get exposure to companies on a very, very constant basis, even with people that are not, with companies that are not in Barcelona, right? And I think this is important uh, to mention that the Career Center provides service and they have contact with companies, not only in Spain, not even only in Europe, right? Because we have a very international pool of students. We have people in the career center that are actually based in other parts of the world. So we have people in Asia, we have people in the Americas. And then these people are building relationships in with local companies so that uh, we can grow also the, the brand in, in these different regions. So whenever our students go back to their home markets, the floor is a bit more prepared to receive them. Yeah, and I think this is something that makes ESA very unique. There's very few MBA programs that have both sides of the box or the funnel that are super international, right? You have um, a super international class, about 85%, right, of your students are from outside Spain. But then you also send 
those MBA graduates to, at least in your last employment report, 20% in Spain, 26% outside Europe, 22% Latin America, and 20% in, in Asia. And I think that's very rare to have. I, th I can only think of a few business schools that have such a, a globally diverse geographical uh, placements, right? Uh, uh, that ESA does. And I'm wondering, you know, having kind of gone through this journey yourself, because on one hand, that can sound very impressive. But on the other hand, it might sound very intimidating because you would think, well, maybe the career resources are, are, are more spread out or the network is more spread out. Most business schools are very strong regionally, right? Where they're based. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, yeah, if you have any tips you can give our listeners, like if they're going to go to such a global school, like ESA, how can they give themselves the best shot of, yeah. of landing their target post-MBA yes. job? That's a great question. And I think that this is a process that, um, a reflection process that should start even before people come to the MBA, right? Um, and also to be realistic with the plans, right? If you come from Latin America and you're planning to stay in Europe or you want to go, you want to work in Asia and then you have no experience in Asia, you don't speak any language uh, of the region. Can you do it? Well, you can, but uh, your chances are not going to be as high, right? Um, so I think it's important that people also consider the, the chances uh, that they have. Because if you come to Europe and you don't have a work permit, you will need a company to sponsor your visa, right? And we are extremely, extremely strong in placements in Europe. As you said it yourself, it's um, with less than, than uh, half of our, our students are actually staying in Europe. Well, while we don't have 50% of the class being European, I think this is also important, right? Uh, so we do have foreigners and international students that are able to stay. I think that it's, it's realistic to have backup plans, right? Okay, I want to come, I want to stay in Europe, but if, the, if, if it doesn't happen, where can I go, right? And then, uh, uh, and, that's, and that's also why we have uh, support in other parts of the world that it's not Europe, right? So it's a very, very large team. But like, if I think that if you want to come to Europe, it's probably the best chance that you're going to have, right? To so doing an MBA in a top school with very, with very good contacts with European companies. But we're still very successful in placing people in different countries in Europe, not only in Spain, uh, we do have a lot of people that uh, want to stay in Spain because they get a taste <laughs> of what it is to live here. And they, and they just want to um, keep their lives, uh, great lives here. Uh, so we do have a lot of people staying. But it's also important to know that um, Spanish can be a must, right? Depending on the, the, the company that you're going to work for. You do have some companies that are very international. For example, we have Amazon. Amazon, you don't have to speak Spanish. Most, uh, even the Spanish Spaniards that uh, work in Amazon, they actually work in English. Uh, you have startups that you don't need to speak Spanish. But if you if you're going for a more local a more local company, you will need the language. But we still have London. We have other cities in Europe that can be more international, like Berlin, Amsterdam. So as an international student, you can aim at those countries but always keeping the, the foot on the ground, right? Um, that there will be a layer of complexity that you will have to overcome, that is the work permit. But if you still don't manage, you have a, and, and, and that's what we're trying to always build, right? If you don't get your plan A, which is to stay in Europe as a non-European, huh? like I'm focusing on the non-Europeans, you would still probably have a very good chance going back home. Right. Um, so if you're Latin American and you want to go back, you have a very large uh, network. If you go back to the U.S., we have very good contacts there as well. Uh, if you come from Asia, we have a lot of people placed in China, in Singapore, in, uh, in South Korea. Japan is a very large community, but we usually have Japanese that go back to Japan. But, it's, you know, like, yes, it is a bit more spread out. But um, I think that the, the big advantage as well is that ESA is a very supportive and collaborative community, right? So even if you don't have that many alumni in a certain country, I'm sure that that person is going to be extremely helpful. 
I think they will go a lot out of their ways uh, to their way to to help you out. Um, but it's also important to be realistic with your uh, with your plans, right? Um, and then do the homework. Which companies sponsor visas? Which don't? Uh, which offices do they need the language? So doing this research even before coming to the MBA, I think it can accelerate your your journey during the MBA because the truth is you don't have the 19 months to sort out what you want, right? So the recruiting trains go by earlier than than we expect, <laughs> so. You need to have a plan when you come. So recently I was talking to a current MBA student and he told me, Darren, you know, one piece of information I wish I had before I committed to this MBA program was I wish I knew like which industries and which companies my business school had close connections with. So mm -hmm. I've added this, this, this question and I'm just curious. Yeah. With ESA. What industries or companies do you think ESA has a special relationship with? Okay. Well, we are very strong. So the biggest um, field is consulting. So consulting takes um, a third of our students. And then it's followed by tech and uh, finance, which is probably the answer that every top business school would give you. <laughs> but I think that the interesting part of, um, of ESA is that... Um, the industries that we call right so everything that is not basically tech finance and and consulting that's pretty big as well right so we do have a lot of diversity also in terms of career aspirations i think that yes if you if you want consulting you will have like a very structured support right um, because you have the consulting club and then you have a lot of people and then like it's it's a more straightforward path to follow right because you know what to do and so on but then something very interesting that the SA has um, put up, uh, put together, is now a structure for the what we call the, the diversified industry, right? So everything that is not tech consulting and 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 finance, and uh, that before was a bit loose, right? You don't have, you don't really know what to do. The processes, the the recruiting processes are not as structured. I don't know how to prepare, and also like most uh, most of these people are just left to chance <laughs> now yes it has built a whole structure and then we have people in the career management that are focused on those people right so that you have a better guide on uh, to follow you know like and, and where to go but again i think yes i understand that what that the mba student was saying but i I, I don't want to discourage also the people that don't have the, the MBA tradition, you know, like traditional path as an as aspiration. You don't need to be or want to be a consultant or a finance or a techie uh, to do an MBA, right? You can, you can, I, I, I went to education. <laughs> I don't think that's a very, very traditional path, uh, but you can also be very, very happy and very successful, right? It might demand a little bit more proactivity. Right and autonomy on on the student side because a lot uh, of that path you'll have to um, to track on your own. But I think that having clarity and focus and knowing your motivation, I think it's the best best uh, advice to have. You know, absolutely, uh, Paula. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I, I just want to ask one final question and and that's if during your recruiting activities or daily work like you just wish more applicants knew about the ESA MBA program so what i would like them to know well i think that what i would like them to know is how transformational the experience at ESA can be and that that's actually what we are looking for, right? We are looking into providing um, an a, a transformational experience to our students, right? So we put a lot of effort in the on-campus experience, right? We, uh, yes, it really goes out of uh, our way to um, provide the uh, best experience that we can to our students, right? In terms of uh, teaching quality, in terms of Team dynamics, in terms of kindness of people in the cafeteria, of the um, 
state of the installations and the facilities on campus, right? The garden is amazing. Everything is beautiful. The um, uh, professors and staff have an open policy, open door policy. So we're always looking to help, uh, helping people. And it's a very deep journey if you really take it seriously, right? Uh, so we want our students to grow their self-awareness so they can know their strengths, know their weaknesses, and know where they need to improve and how the MBA can do that. And, and then with all the, that um, journey being followed, at the end, you will feel how much you've transformed and how much of a better person you actually are, right? And I think that uh, by being a better person, by consequence, you become a better professional, right? So I think that that's really what we're looking at, we're going for at the essay, is that people become their, the best version of themselves, right? We're, we don't expect people to just be better at, at, than everyone, but we want them to be the best uh, versions of themselves. So they can go back to the real world and drive the impact, uh, most impact that they can. I think that's a great place. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's a great place to end uh, our interview, Paula. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes, thank you, Darren. This has been lovely. And I hope it's helpful for everyone. Enjoy the journey. The application process can be very stressful, I know, very overwhelming. Uh, but uh, take it as an opportunity for you to dive deep, uh, deep dive on yourselves, right? To do some self-reflection, which is something that we don't usually do. Um, and enjoy and good luck to all of you. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Remember, you can get free school selection help and a profile review at touchmba.com. You can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter, just search